Welcome, everybody. My name is Andy Lieber. I am the director of the Center for Cognitive and Brain Sciences at The Ohio State University. And this is our third and final main event for the 2022 COGFest series. Um, you will, if you've heard about COGFest, in addition to this event, we've had presentations of undergraduate research. We had a film screening this past weekend of the film Upgrade. And today we are here to have an expert panel discussion, uh, talk about that film. So just quick, uh, just orienting as we get started, we have live transcription. If you navigate to the bottom of your window, um, that will be on the bottom right. Um, you can just click on live transcripts. We are recording. Um, we're going to do this. We're going to do this. In... Oh, I'm sorry. Someone say something. Nope. We're going to do this in a way that um, we. I'll introduce all of our panelists, and then we'll just get started talking about the film. And people can use. Um, there's a Q and A function that people can use to enter some questions that we will try to respond to. So we'll begin with uh, Dr. Marcy Bachbrader. Dr. Bachbrader received her PhD at Indiana University and her uh, medical degree at Ohio State University. And she's a board certified physiatrist with subspecialty certifications in brain injury medicine and addiction medicine. She applies cognitive neuroscience principles from her PhD training to clinical problems in neuro, re neuro rehabilitation and neuromodulation. Dr. Brock Bachbrader has published on neuro rehabilitation technology and cognitive neuroscience techniques translated for use in clinical populations, leading clinical trials in repetitive transcranial magnetic stimulation, otherwise known as TMS, um, transcranial direct current stimulation, which you may have heard of as DC TDCS, and vagus nerve stimulation, as well as brain computer interface technologies. Her, experience, her expertise extends to electroencephalography analysis, visual psychophysics, brain computer interfaces, functional imaging, and non invasive brain stimulation. While she was at the OSU Neurological Institute, she collaborated with the Battelle Memorial Institute on a clinical trial of a brain computer interface, or a BCI, um, which was a neuromuscular stimulator system that enables patients with spinal cord injury to regain motor control of their paralyzed limbs. You may know the most famous patient involved in this trial, Ian Burkhart, who used this system to regain his ability to grasp and manipulate objects, establishing proof of concept for this novel neurotechnology. And she has worked to integrate uh, this technology with neurorehabilitation in other ways as well. She's currently, uh, forgot your title at the very beginning, the Chief Medical and Scientific Officer at BEP Medical Group. Um, and it's a pleasure to have you here, Marcy. I'm gonna go to our uh, next speaker, Shuru Shang, uh, who is an assistant professor in the Department of Computer Science and Engineering here at Ohio State. Uh, Dr. Shang is our expert on artificial intelligence. She's an assistant professor, as I mentioned, um, over in computer science, and she works on machine learning and algorithmic decision making. Her research aims to understand societal impacts of machine learning and develop algorithms that are aligned with social norms, uh, for instance, privacy and fairness, and um, reliable to dynamic, uh, in a way that's reliable to dynamic environments. She has been a recipient of a pre-doctoral fellowship at the University of Michigan and rising stars in EECS in 2020. I just realized I don't know what EECS stands for, but I'm gonna assume it has to do with electrical engineering and computer science perhaps. Um, and a Caltech Young Investigators Lecturer in 2021. Uh, pleasure to have you here, Shuru. Um, and our last uh, panelist is uh, Dr. Dana Howard, who is an assistant professor in the Center for Bioethics and, department, and the Department of Biomedical Ana Anatomy um, and Education in the College of Medicine at Ohio State University. Um, Dr. Howard is an assistant is, as mentioned, is there, but she holds a secondary appointment in the Department of Philosophy over here in the College of Arts and Sciences, where CCBS is based. Um, prior to coming to Ohio State, Dana was a postdoctoral fellow in the Department of Bioethics at the National Institutes of Health and became a steering committee member at, for the Center for Ethics and Human Values Steering Committee in 2017. Dr. Howard's work focuses on ethical issues that surround medical decision making especially the decisions made on behalf of those who cannot decide on their own. 
She also focuses on the norms of advising and the role that our anticipatory attitudes like hope and retrospective attitudes like regret should play in our decision making. So it is a pleasure to have you here, Dana. It's a pleasure to have all of you here. And with that, we can get underway. So um, as, as our attendees can see, we have a broad range of expertise represented on our panel. I am here to serve as a moderator. Um, quick introduction of me, I'm the director and I'm also an associate professor in the Department of Psychology. Um, and I work in the realm of cognitive neuroscience, but rather than offering any of my specific knowledge, I'm just going to try to pick the brains of the folks up here today. So, um, so we can get started. We all just watched the film this weekend. Um, and possibly before we turn to questions, I'm curious what your overall impressions were of this film. How much does it seem like good cognitive science? How realistic was it? Is this our future? Those sorts of things. Um, so we can start in the order that I introduced you, uh, if Marcy wants to go ahead. Speaking as a physician who has taken care of individuals with spinal cord injury, similar to the character in the film, um, I would say several things were accurate and um, true to life. And I think the, the most important things that struck me just from, and, and how do we take this film are number one, you, you saw in the film that this person who probably had a C5 level of injury, they, they referred to it as C4, but similar. So you would expect him to be able to shrug his shoulders and maybe um, flex his biceps on his own, but not much else if it was a complete injury. So what you saw was somebody taking care of him. Um, people with that level of injury tend to be very dependent on, on other people for nearly all of their needs, even just to get in and out of bed. So I think that that was represented very well. The other thing that, that struck me um, was how he was recruited to, to get the neural implant in the first place. And I think in as much as we're going to have some ethical discussions here, that is that is both a, um, how do I put this, a problem that I think is not well solved, but also an opportunity for patients. So currently, trials um, typically require that people are at least a year out from injury. And so what that means is that's literally the, the point where we think the nervous system isn't going to change all that much. But up to a year, we tell patients, you know what, you might spontaneously regain function. Um, and he was three months out. So there's, there's a whole slew of other issues associated with being three months out, but recruiting patients who look helpless, who are in a hospital bed, who are um, negotiating how or whether they will ever, ever live independently again. And, and perhaps they've been through traumatic experiences where they've, they've lost important people in their lives. That's pretty accurate. That's, I think, something that we need to think about both in terms of if we're, we're offering implants to people, it's where are they in their decision-making process? How vulnerable are they? And, and what sorts of things are we actually promising them with this opportunity. And I will throw one other nugget out there. At this point, um, the, the technology that we have is not authorized for long-term implants. So nearly everybody who would join a study these days um, would be looking at the near certain knowledge that even if they regain function, um, they will need to be explanted at some point. And sometimes that's because the technology becomes obsolete. And sometimes that's um, because they develop infection. Um, but the material can biodegrade. There can be immune reactions. There are so many things really that we could talk about, but I'm going to leave it there because 
I think, you know, we, we can touch on some of these issues, but there's so much more. And I'm, I'm curious to see what my other presenters have to say. Great setup, um, really interesting insights. Uh, so, Shuru. Yes, so um, after looking at that uh, movie, I feel uh, really we see a lot of the AI and uh, this technology it's really plays, uh, it's very powerful. It can bring many social benefits to the patients or to many people that uh, are disabled. Yeah, but in the meantime, that we need to be careful is that the AI sometimes can be harmful. I mean, if we do not use them with care and it may bring some uh, harm to our societies. Actually, I see I can connect them to the research that I'm doing. So because one part of my research is to address the societal um, social ethical issues that may raise uh, from the AI. So for example, the AI, they can, it's possible that they are not robust. So at the beginning of the film, we can see that that autonomous driving car vehicles, it can have some accident. And actually it happens in the real world. And we, we see that, so we see in many news that the Tesla car and sometimes I have accidents. And this all because that AI uh, models, they can be very vulnerable uh, to the environment. And, uh, and because all the AI uh, models are developed with, the, with a lot of the data sets, but those data sets may not will represent the real world scenarios. So if, if the models cannot be generalized well to the environment, it's possible that the model can, when we use the model to make the decisions, it may cause some harm. And uh, it may, we may be better off if we're not using, uh, not using this AI uh, models. So that's something that we think, uh, that's, that's something that I learned from this movie is that, and uh, we need to consider uh, both the benefits and the, and the, uh, uh, and the dangerous and to build the socially responsible um, AI, uh, AI models, yeah. Very interesting, yeah. So um, I'll like wear my like research ethicist from the like NIH hat for a second. And I'll say that one thing that was real about it was that research as it was done, wouldn't have been approved by um, an IRB. Um, so there was a lot of salient information that Logan did not get before he was able to make an informed decision about whether or not to actually get the implant. Um, so Marcy brought up, you know, the vulnerability, lots of research, lots of high risk research, lots of research with a lot of uncertainty is conducted. Um, especially with first in human trials, especially in this sort of context, but it's super important to like articulate what the sort of known certain, like what the known like um, features that, uh, that the researchers know might be very important uh, for a decision, not even might be. So the way in which it actually works is like the researchers basically have to come up with any possible piece of information that may uh, influence the decision of the potential participants about whether to participate. And we saw Logan was missing some, no, Logan Gray was missing some important information. Um, so that was like one thing. I mean, in some ways it was reality because it wasn't conducted um, through uh, any sort of federally funded research program. And instead it was a kind of biohack, which is a thing that we see being conducted all the time. And especially there's, you know, a, a community of people that are doing this kind of research on themselves. Um, in some ways to sort of circumvent and show proof of process, uh, like concept for some of these issues. Um, so, so that was my like NIH hat. My like philosopher hat um, will just say, my, my initial reaction leaving the film was that, I thought the film was most interesting before we learned that STEM was now autonomous inside Gray's body. So like when, after the hack, and then we find out, so it's like, we don't know that STEM is still is autonomous at that point, but when we find out that now STEM is this autonomous entity in Gray's body, in some ways, a lot of the interesting moral and psychological and like questions about free will became less interesting to me. And I think that the like the first half of the movie, there are a lot of really interesting questions about when are people responsible? 
right? And it's like, you know, just because you, um, if you authorize an action, but you don't know what possible effects of that action are going to be, are you responsible for that action? Like all of those questions I thought were super interesting and they became a little bit less interesting when AI became like the evil overlord that was like inhabiting Gray's, Gray's body. <laughs> so I'd like to just jump on that idea of embodied intelligence. And I think that was one of the, the, the major issues in, in this movie. And for me as a scientist, oh my gosh, it would be great if we could just put in a gadget and turn it on and there it goes, you know, paralysis is over. Um, the reality doesn't look like that. Um, and part of the issue is beyond the training the algorithms, beyond the making the implant something that body tissues can accept and, and work with long, long term, there's this idea of needing to integrate the two together. And in order to make that work, you either have to completely pull everything from the human into the technology and hand over decision-making, or you need to integrate the, the technological bridge or whatever it is in with the human decision-making. Um, th there are ways to blur the lines, uh, but the reality is getting to that state of embodiment right now um, probably wouldn't have happened just with an implant in the spinal cord because everything that, that we know about human perception suggests that, for example, the AI wouldn't have had, had access to things that Greg could have seen or heard from the spinal cord level. But, but more importantly, some of the work that my lab did with the, the patient with a C5 level spinal cord injury who had a brain computer implant to control his hand function showed that there was a basically a mapping of his sensory universe and his motor cortex. And so that's the shared representation that the AI would have had to have access to. And in order for you to do that level of, of integration, at some level, you also have to think about how long is it going to take for the integration to happen? So for, again, as an example, my patient, um, the way our AI worked is it looked at um, some 90 some channels of neural firing in real time um, and, tried to match up patterns that we told the computer that the person was thinking with actual neural activity. And so it learned over time. So think about this, the brain's changing constantly. So the interface needs to change with the human. So the interface needs to learn the human. The human needs to learn the, inter the, the interface and then um, nothing static. But that process of integration took our interface about 500 milliseconds. So if you're thinking about reacting to a ball thrown at you, 500 milliseconds is way too long for you to be able to catch the ball. Or if you're driving a car to stop your car without crashing. So if you think about, you know, what are some of the challenges to basically put in an interface and have it turn on? I think that time component, how fast can we integrate the information that's that's coming from two different systems so that they are really seamless? That's an important component. And then there's the secondary question of if you achieve that kind of integration, are they two separate components ultimately? And what we found with our participant he had actually created in his brain a representation of his ability to use his arm as a neuroprosthetic. And from an ethical standpoint, when it came time for his explant, he said, this is part of my body. This is now part of me. Um, and he wasn't psychologically, emotionally ready to get that explant, even though it was part of the 35 odd page consent form that he signed ahead of time. And that's another big thing I think that this technology um, brings to mind. We don't know what the ethical questions are going to be five years from now. 
we don't know what the laws need to look like to protect people. We can guess. Um, and I think the other thing that is is a really important aspect of the ethical questions, who's designing this technology? Um, are we designing it from a business and a commercial gain standpoint? Um, are we designing it because we want to know more about the, how the brain works? Is it just scientific? Are we designing it because even if it doesn't completely change um, whether a paralyzed person can move around and walk, maybe it only improves their function a little bit. Is that good enough? Um, do we do this incrementally? So I'll throw that out there. There's a lot of different things I think we can talk about here. I mean, maybe I'll um, just sort of, so there was a question in the chat about um, disability and how the film represents disability, which was something that um, I was hoping we would get to. Um, it was uh, a response that was, one that was uh, sent to us. And I think that this is related to something that Marcy just said about the ways in which um, prosthetics and tools are, do become, uh, for many people, do become part of their body. So, and it doesn't have to be sort of an internal thing. It doesn't even have to be a personal identity thing, but it's just sort of the way in which our bodies and the tools that we use to navigate the world really do end up having, um, I mean, they, they become part of us, right? And so, um, and this actually came up Recently, when it came to at the beginning of COVID-19, um, there were lots of different sort of priority setting um, in hospitals and according to state about how to use um, scarce resources like ventilators, for example. Lots of people um, with chronic conditions just do use ventilators um, for their everyday existence. Lots of people who are paraplegic do. And there was very much a concern about whether or not if they actually went to the emergency room, went, got COVID, went to the hospital, they would actually lose access to part of them, right? Like part of the tools that they use in order to navigate this world. Um, so in that way, I think that, you know, really thinking about, that's another way in which I felt like the movie became less interesting when the when STEM became this sort of autonomous, like, um, agent inside of Gray's body. And then it was this sort of like competing, these competing two agents working against each other, because I do think that that experience is very different from the experience that a lot of people, when you actually read um, BCI, like when you read participants in these sorts of BCI um, work, a lot of them do really start identifying with the technology. And I think the point that Marcy brings up about, you know, it's like you could write this out in the form consent document, but the connections before they actually, right? Can they anticipate it? I don't know. There are real questions about whether well, people can actually provide informed consent related to research participation. Very interesting. So we, we do have uh, a question. It looks like Marcy might be typing an answer uh, in the Q&A. So uh, feel free to use the Q&A for questions or the chat window. It's, either one is fine. And some people have separately contacted us with questions. Um, but uh, did you want to type that out, Marcy, or do you want to, should we just address it? I can, I can read what I was typing, I suppose. Yeah. So uh, what I would say is... Let's, let's just read the question first. It's, oh, uh, sorry. That would help. <laughs> uh, I was wondering how far we have gone with these repl uh, these replacement devices. And I guess we could take that in two ways. One is the initial implant and, and possibly an artificial limb or, or such, or maybe if you get explanted and then have a replacement for that. Um, Heard that trials are happening with paraplegic people for them to learn to control an artificial limb with their mind, and that's much of what uh, Marcy's been involved in. Except you've done uh, actual limbs in a paraplegic, but artificial limbs there's been much work on as well. 
and I don't know if we'll have time, but it seems inevitable that we might get to what Elon Musk has claimed to invent that's been around for 20 years. But, um, but yeah, so I'm going to go ahead. So um, there's a rich history of this already. And OSU demonstrated the first so-called neurobridge to link a brain-computer interface to reanimate a person's own limb in 2016. Um, since that time, there has been much work to link the brain-computer interface to something called a um, networked neuroprosthetic, and Case in particular is doing this. And that I think is is probably the most advanced system that controls also autonomic functions as well as potentially upper limb movements uh, with the the brain computer interface. I don't believe that they've published on that yet, but I do know that they have implanted a person, and they have separately many people who have the the networked neuroprosthetics that are not under brain computer interface control. Um, the EPFL, Gregor Kut, Kut, I can't say his name, Coutine, something like this. It's it's French, sorry. Um, is working on a brain computer spinal cord interface that would potentially restore the ability for a paraplegic to move. Um, I know that he has successfully demonstrated in rodents and primates, and he now has at least one, possibly two humans who are working on trials of that. And that builds on not just the brain computer interface work, but also the spinal cord stimulation work that some American researchers have been doing for a very long time, um, demonstrating that if you use a spinal cord stimulator, much like is used for pain control in people with chronic pain, you can, um, boost the signal through the neural pathways in the spinal cord and to some degree um, provide a, a replacement signal that allows people who were paralyzed from the waist down to walk again. There are other people who are um, working on direct neural cuff electrodes, so to relink the brain to specific nerves in the body. Um, one thing to take from this is there are a lot of different approaches um, for, for what you want to, do you want to restore sensation? Do you want to restore movement? Do you want to restore bowel and bladder control? And for just as, as many of the applications, there are multiple different kinds of implants. Um, some of them record, some of them stimulate. And then there are about a gazillion different algorithms for how do you handle the massive data that comes from trying to replace the activity of the nervous system. And on top of that, you have some of the decision-making algorithms and questions about um, should the computer just be in control of these decision-making algorithms so that you, know, you, you set it up to solve a problem and it solves it with machine learning? Um, or do you want to have some level of supervision by a human somewhere or the human using it? So there's, we, we say brain computer interface like it's one technology, but, but we're really talking about the life's work of hundreds of people. I, I have one thing to like add to that, but I'm actually interested from Zuru to see what you think about just sort of the way that the decision-making feature of the algorithms and whether whether you think that the whether you think that um, we there are you know which path is the more promising path forward in terms of thinking about how we should like design the algorithm features. Yes, also in addition to, uh, to those, and there are a lot of the devices that are uh, produced for helping this, uh, disabled peoples. I think in particular, I think the AI plays a very important role. I, I think, uh, for example, those that are artificial arm uh, that helping the, uh, helping the gray, that person 
to uh, to decide uh, to, to inject the medicines. And I think that I think uh, the, that that's the a lot of the uh, technologies out there. Yeah, but unfortunately, I'm I'm not very familiar particular uh, directions uh, of those research. But I believe that uh, uh, that is very uh, quite virtual. I believe that in the future it can uh, can benefit uh, a lot of the uh, patients. Yeah. Yeah. I would like to move into uh, more of Shuru's domain for a moment. Um, one of the things that I that I think many of us found unique about the film, and as Dana pointed out, especially before the, the point in which STEM becomes autonomous, is that you have this artificial intelligence that's embedded in, in somebody's body and can't make any of its own decisions, uh, which gets to a number of ethical questions that I'm sure Dana can get to. And I wanna hear what you're gonna have to say about that. But um, to, to what extent is something like that ever going to happen? Um, this is for sure. I mean, how far do we need to come to get to that being realistic? Yes, oh, I think, um... Uh, for the uh, really for the machine to take over the, the entire control, I think that's so far I'm not worried. And but uh, there is something um, I want to emphasize is that really there is this uh, dynamics between the society and the AI technologies. That our society is actually reshaped by the technologies because the human they take actions in response to those uh, algorithmic uh, decisions that's made by the AI technologies. So something that uh, we need to be careful is that to develop AI by taking into account this dynamics, and uh, otherwise there there will be the feedback loop between AI and uh, and and in society, and it's possible that so sometimes that uh, the the decisions that may, that may made with AI may in the long run may lead to some adverse uh, undesirable outcomes. So something that uh, a researcher tries to do is to come up with this machine learning with human in the loop. To try to bring in the domain expert and to regulate the well uh, the the domains that were the AI used for making the decisions. So to how to co cooperate between the how can the human cooperate with AI to make the better decisions to make the socially responsible decisions. I think that's something that uh, uh, we need to consider. I mean we cannot let AI to do all the job. We need to have this expert to to supervise the AI. Yeah. And maybe we can just, um, thank you, and we can add to that um, a question um, with regard to merging identities. So this would be gray and STEM, I'm assuming. In real life brain-computer interface experiments, to what extent is the machine component personified like how STEM in the movie is? Technically, it's own entity given its own voice. So I guess I should have read that question before asking my question, because wow, that's so similar. and. Uh, yeah, sorry to our anonymous attendee who posed that. Um, so, yeah, I guess there's a number of pieces to address in that question there. If sure you want to keep going with that one. Are you able to see the question uh, in the Q&A from anonymous? Yes. So if I understand the uh, question correctly. Um, so it means that the technology can uh, have its own voice. The, so yeah, again, as I, uh, I think I still goes back to the uh, question, uh, to the topic that I was discussing. Yeah, it is possible that uh, the, there exists this, uh, under that self-reinforcing loop, the AI, may eventually cause some harm to our society. And uh, this is not only uh, uh, something, uh, I think that's uh, as, uh, some other uh, applications actually we already see in the real, real life. I mean, in other applications, for example, the autonom uh, automatic hiring, the automatic lending, we already see that phenomena. That when we use the uh, AI algorithms to make automated decisions, like the lending decisions, it's possible that those uh, those uh, uh, those uh, algorithms may be, I see, may, may have some harm 
for example, it may be biased against some population. Uh, against some social groups. And those bias will further be captured in the data set used for training the future models. So let's see examples how the bias can be propagated in the uh, AI algorithms and can be self-reinforcing in the long run. And similarly, I think uh, for many other uh, issues, there exists this self-reinforcing loop. And if we do not uh, do not use the AI with care, with, with carefully, it's possible that the AI dominant and eventually lead us to some undesirable outcomes. So again, I think that something we need to take, uh, we need to be careful is that we need to have this human supervised under the human supervision. Okay, we need to do it everything in the socially responsible way. Yeah, I'm not sure that I under the answer the question. Uh, yeah. I would argue even further than that. When you think about creating the algorithms themselves, um, what you're really doing is specifying a problem that machine learning is trying to solve, for example. Um, and so it is a very important consideration of who's framing that problem, because the type of solution that you get is going to maximize whatever parameters that you put in it. So if, if your solution is going to, um, let's say, um, speed the, the linkage between the prosthetic and the human. Um, maybe you eventually get to the point where you're able to create superhuman reflexes, right? Um, if you are creating technology that is absolutely the cheapest to implement, um, maybe you end up with something that degrades quickly over time and causes lots of medical problems. Um, and so you don't, for example, get to see what technology could have happened if a person kept their implant for 25, 50 years. So when we think about how we specify the problems that we want the B BCI or the AI, or however you think about this neurotechnology, we, I think from an ethical perspective, the most important thing is to imagine what function you're trying to optimize? Whose problems are you trying to solve? Because ultimately, um, whatever you create, I think of AI as like a child and, and the people doing the programming are, are like parents. So what are you trying to teach this technology? Um, and if you think about the limits of human imagination, that's probably where the limits of these sorts of technologies can go. And so while I don't think we necessarily can um, anticipate all of the, the problems and the dilemmas in, in the future, but I think we can think deliberately about what we want to teach it and why, who's doing the teaching and um, whose outcomes are we trying to maximize? And I'll just add, um, I mean, I think the functionality point is really important and who the stakeholders or who's actually authorized to sort of make these decisions or priority, like set priorities for the research is super important. Um, Marcy mentioned earlier, you know, there's like different, not only thinking about the AI, but just thinking about the problem that is like, what is going to, what is the problem that needs to be solved, right? Um, in terms of like functionality and from like a disability perspective, there's a lot of interest in being able to walk, right? Uh, and there's a lot of interest potentially in doing certain things that might look really cool, but don't necessarily make um, ones like uh, more capable of living independent lives, right? And so one of the things that is super important is to actually work with um, people, you know, work with the disability community, work with people that have, different kinds of disabilities and potentially at different stages of their lives. Um, so, I mean, one of the things, again, um, this is going back to Marcy's point about, you know, the limits of our imagination. Um, having, you know, bowel control seems like something that if you have bowel control, that would be like number one on the list. Like that is such a high priority, right? But um, when it comes to people who need to have, um, what do you call the, the bags, the cost, 
I'm, I'm this is like where I'm a philosopher and bags. like what is the, what are they colostomy bags colostomy bags so colostomy bags so it's like when you ask people whether like how like what they expect their welfare to be if they needed to use a colostomy bag they like they say oh my god that would be like really horrible that would be potentially worse than like a life worth living right and then like a year later you ask people who need to use colostomy bags and they're like, it's fine. It's just like a thing that people get used to, right? And so one of the things that happens a lot with a lot of this sort of, I mean, one of the things that Marcy brought up at the beginning of the conversation was like, we have to think about the point in which we're recruiting participants. And then also the point in which this technology is going to be the most useful um, in terms of being an intervention. And it's at this sort of transition point where people aren't necessarily um, used to their new embodied situation in a way in which certain things like, you know, like what counts as um, the problem that needs to be fixed might be different than someone who has been paraplegic for 20 years. And then it may not be any technology that is inherent in the body that is going to be needing to be fixed. It might be just like making the environment more accessible, right? So I think that really highlighting the point of who needs to actually be at the table for priority setting for this research is a super important one. And NIH has recognized that at least for paralysis. Um, as recently, I wanna say it was 2019, I think. They brought together stakeholders from industry, people from uh, the patient community, caregivers, and um, that was where some of the insights into what what's a minimum viable device specifically, um, what's good enough to take home. And a lot of people argued that um, there, there are things that get in their way of functioning that there really are no good replacements for. So yes, we have a colostomy bag for, for bowel function. We have a wheelchair for people who are unable to walk. Uh, but for someone who can't pick up and hold an object in their hand to feed themselves, yes, there are some appliances that you can put on someone's arm. Um, but it also assumes that you have the forelimb control to, to get that to your mouth. Um, there aren't a lot of great options, but if you can return the ability to, to feed yourself, to um, use your hands in the, in the way that many people are used to using them their entire life, suddenly, not only does that individual cost society much less money um, because you're not paying for around the, the clock caregiver, but you're also returning some life roles to that person that they couldn't participate in previously with, with their injury, and also restoring a, a sense of self-efficacy, self-confidence, um, that there are things they can do for themselves. So in some ways it's, it's self-value. And I think there, there are a lot of opportunities in the field. I think there's a lot of unrealized potential, but absolutely correct. All of this needs to be guided by the end users. There have been some surveys, particularly for some of the, the neuroprosthetics that are available. And one of the prevailing concerns of the end users was if it takes too long for me to put it on or to calibrate it, um, I'm not going to use it. So if that's the case, you have to balance uh, ease of use. Like, do you literally need to have a neurotechnologist and a physician and a physical therapist there to, to set up that neuro bridge every day that person's going to use it? Um, because if so, that's way too much effort and people are not going to integrate that into their daily life. And in that case, maybe something much simpler, um, much less technologically, technologically advanced would be preferred. Right. The other question for me as a rehabilitation professional that I find both ethically challenging and, and scientifically and medically promising is we saw recovery of function for this person who was two years out from his spinal cord injury. Turns out he had 
his spinal cord wasn't severed. So there was some unconscious level of information that was going both directions um, below his level of injury. We know this because we, we tested some of his sensory functions in, in places where he didn't have conscious sensation. And we could pair that with sensory responses we found in his brain. Um, so for, for those people who asked, what is the level of the AI for a person using this sort of neurobridge? At this point, the level of AI is basically your unconscious brain. It's trying to pull together different pieces of information or send out motor commands so that some of those things come to your conscious awareness, but you're not necessarily thinking um, the, the individual neurons firing that control your fingers or that um, give you a sensory perception from your fingers, let's say. Um, but you might become aware of the, the pressure of the object in your hand. Um, it's definitely not a voice in your head, right? And will we ever get to that place? Who knows, right? Um, maybe. But I think in order to get there, we would have to separately be able to develop both the more cognitive linguistic AI as well as the sensory motor control AI and then integrate them together. And then again, you've got that timing issue that I talked about before. Um, you've got processes that you need to interleave seamlessly. And that's, you know, it's a tough one. So going back to, I think it's important to, to understand what people want, to understand the limits of our technology and what, what teams do you need to build? What technologic problems do you need to solve? How much is it going to cost? Um, and how do you balance that against the cost that you need to spend if we're talking about disability um, in, in taking care of disabled people? We spend billions every year taking care of disabled people. Um, the technology that, that we used for the, the person who was at OSU, it, the technology alone cost $100,000. Um, so it is actually, it's been approved recently by the FDA for, it's not emergency use, it's, it's sort of the next level of, um, for, for orphan diseases to allow people to, for example, communicate if they have ALS. Um, to, to create some of these motor interfaces for people with spinal cord injury. But the community of people around the technology that you need in order to put it in place, the number of therapy hours that you need to give the person using it to be, to be able to use it successfully, I think those present some barriers to the implementation. And then you also ask questions like, who are the people who are actually going to be able to be supported in the use of these devices? Um, we know people from Appalachia have a hard time getting to places like Columbus to do their therapy. Um, if they don't have the people to support them with their basic bodily needs, they're probably not going to be able to support them for something that is above and beyond like using this neurotechnology. Um, and right now our society doesn't um, provide the level of support even just the average disabled person needs on a routine basis. And that's so much worse with COVID. If you think about the people in our community who were vulnerable with COVID, the, the community caregivers who went out to people with disabilities to try to help them um, just get out of bed, take care of the bowel and bladder. A lot of those people were exposed to, to COVID because of being out in the community. And so we, we don't have the resources and things like a pandemic make our resources even less. So in, in an environment of limited resources, who is going to be able to utilize, even if we had a perfect world where we developed everything and it worked great on the first time and you didn't need someone like me standing over your shoulder using it, who are the people who are going to be lucky enough to get to try it? Very interesting thoughts there. Yeah, a lot of things to think about. Uh, so we've got a question from uh, another, another question here, um, which some of, some of this has been touched upon, but let's uh, read this out. In addition to restoring function of an injured individual, the movie was also about upgrading or enhancing function. 
So we discussed briefly enhancement, uh, but maybe let's focus on that a little bit. Please discuss current research on enhancing human cognitive and movement abilities and the ethics of this research. So neurostimulation uh, is, is one way to, we think, enhance cognitive and movement abilities. And so some of those things are either electrical or magnetic brain stimulation. Interestingly, some of the athletes in the 2020 Olympics, I believe, no, 2016, we didn't have it, 2020, um, some of the swimmers were using it prior to their event. So there are pictures of them wearing these um, devices to do brain stimulation. And the thought is what this stuff does is actually enhance your neuroplasticity and, and make your practice more efficient. So it's neural doping. Is it regulated? No. Should it be? Maybe. I mean, we, we regulate lots of other things. Um, other forms of enhancing function are things like wearing exoskeletons to, to make a person stronger. Um, that's real. Um, and some of those exoskeletons are actually under brain computer interface control, especially EEG type interfaces. Uh, but you still have the same issue of the delay, the time delay. So what we don't have right now is a brain computer interface that, that makes a person faster or stronger in real time. So let's, uh, let's imagine that we've got all of it and now let's turn to the ethics of this sort of thing. So let's, maybe we can even throw in a little bit of a trade-off where uh, there's a company out there, it's named, I don't know, Plesla, and it's placing implants into your brain for $799, uh, $799, maybe $10,000, let's be realistic. And everyone's lining up to get them. We don't know how long they last. However, if you don't get one, you're not going to be enhanced and you might fall behind. So what happens? So, I mean, um, I'll take this one. I'll start with it. Um, so there's obviously the questions about distributive justice and who gets it and who doesn't. I mean, there's a lot of um, sort of transhumanist ethicists who basically argue, well, that's not an ethical question about enhancement. That's a political justice question about distribution. And that's how we resolve that. Um, so Sevalescu makes this argument and, um, and, you know, people also make the same sorts of claims when it comes to sports or like enhancements related to that. Isn't this just cheating? And um, the arguments that some ethicists who are just sort of like, you know, pushing the transhumanist um, perspective basically argue that like, isn't all sports enhanced? Like all of this is about like pushing your body in certain ways. This is actually a way in which you're expressing your agency. Um, as Marcy was talking about, you know, the, it's like these are actual like neurostimulants that just make you more neurally plastic that then you like actually work harder and you train your muscles better to do the thing in like a higher, faster way. Like that actually doesn't undermine the sport. It just makes people better at it. And isn't that always what technology related to athletics was doing. So that's sort of like the transhumanist sort of argument is that, you know, a lot of the worries and fears that people have aren't distinctive to these kinds of um, technologies or advances related to human enhancement. Um, they're just the same old boring questions we've been worried about when it comes to how, what we owe to each other, right? So one final sort of, I'm just like sort of pushing the sort of transhumanist perspective, I don't necessarily believe it, but like one final way of th thinking about this, and this comes up in gray, and I forget what the like super soldier trans, like the, you know, the non-human, transhuman guy was, the bad guy, um, or one of the bad guys. So he's like, you know, you, there was this idea that like once people are upgraded, then what they want to do is like destroy the non-upgraded people, right? And it's like, 
That's actually not clear that that would be what would happen, especially if we think about cognitive and emotional enhancement. Like, you know, it's like people still might have a moral sense, like they still might have real like attachment and reasons of solidarity with their fellow man, or we should just expect them to have that even if they have these upgrades, right? So all of those things are sort of the arguments that the transhumanists make that like, you know, people are worried about this technology in such a way that actually the solutions aren't get rid of the technology. The solutions are like, we need to fix our world and we need to be better to each other. And that's just not gonna change when we have these technologies. Yeah, so add to that, uh, I want to talk about this uh, uh, two ethical issues, the privacy and fairness. And when you, when you, when the company is that to plant something inside your brain to enhance your abilities, uh, and you definitely they are collecting some data. And can we trust those companies? And isn't our privacy violated? So in this case, how can we preserve those privacy? So what type of the pre privacy preserving technologies that we should use? Also, when we impose those uh, private preserving technologies, maybe there is a trade-off between the privacy and the performance. Because achieving the in order to protect privacy is possible that the device, the enhancement uh, get, uh, uh, get decreased. So how can we balance this trade-off? So there are a lot of things that uh, we need to consider. And I believe that uh, we should have pumped up with some data uh, protection uh, regulation and laws to regulate this area. And also there is this fairness issues. That I, because I believe that for those devices, when they develop those devices, it's built on, the, um, on massive data. But those data can be highly imbalanced, and especially for the healthcare and the patient data, because they, they, many, most of those patient data, I think, is collected from a few states across the US. So in this case, the different racial uh, people from the different race or a different gender or different age groups they may have the different uh, disparate impact on the different social groups. So in this case, isn't uh, the enhancement. So even though that both of us implement those things to enhance our ability, this enhancement can be different across different peoples. So how can we address these issues? So I think that those are some um, ethical issues that uh, need to be considered if really this, uh, in the future that we have this type of companies. So I would add to all of those things one more thing. Um, and I think this is very reflective of something else that's happening these days, which is people going to online sources to get their DNA mapped and then the DNA being public and potentially um, something that, for example, is it something that can be used against you or your children for life insurance, health insurance, um, job decision-making, things like that. I could see if there were widespread implants that some of the neural data that was collected could be basically your neural imprint, something like a fingerprint. So if that were the case, then potentially you could be identified um, based on your, your neural activity. At this point, we don't know if... Um, two people, if their neural activity, depending on where it was collected, um, is it similar enough that a person, an entity, an AI wouldn't be able to tell the difference between, let's say, the three of us on the panel? Or could they really detect which one of us was present at a particular location doing a particular thing maybe that we shouldn't have been doing? Um, and I think that that raises implications along the lines of Whose data is it, number one? Um, number two, is it medical data? Is it subject to some of the same privacy rules as a lot of other medical data? And three, what? how can people who don't necessarily own the data but have access to the data, what sorts of things are ethical and legal decisions that those people can make while still protecting the rights of individuals? Our next film screening will have to be Gattaca uh, to address those questions. Um, very interesting questions. There's, there's some literature arguing that if you just measure behavior, phenotypic presentation, 
even like the rate of keystrokes on a computer, what people like, what people scroll through, eye movements, uh, a number of other things. Uh, you might learn enough about them that you don't even need DNA or brain data. Um, so much of our extended mind is interfacing with devices that are already here, um, our behaviors with our phone. But uh, I think as epigenetics gets further and further, that then knowing our DNA is definitely going to be more and more of an issue. Um, okay, I have I have a geeky plot question about the movie that we could take in a few different ways. So there's a scene where it's the car chase scene. Gray is in his old analog car that has no electronics. He's flying down the highway and Stem says to him, I can't do anything. This is all you at this point. Um, so the first question related to that is, well, STEM was able to engage in hand-to-hand -hand combat, do all sorts of other things. Why can't STEM just control the steering wheel? And so, okay, it's a plot hole, perhaps. You can either disagree or agree with that. I'm curious to hear that, but- I have the same thought. So, so maybe it's a plot hole, but clearly that scene is a vehicle for some reflection. I, I shouldn't have said vehicle because he's in a car, but it's, it's a device to have us think about some issues, maybe about possibly the limitations of digital uh, AI, or um, I'm not sure what. So I'm just curious to hear what your thoughts are about that scene. Um, and yeah, that's the question in any order, so. I mean, I'll just say that like, there are some plot holes. So, I mean, so let's just like, the boring answer maybe is that there were just some plot holes, but like, you know, the more fun answer is just like thinking about, well, how would that be possible with the like, the hand-to-hand -hand co combat? And maybe you imagine that in that house, there was in the house where he engages in the hand-to-hand -hand combat, there is a lot of technology everywhere, right? And so one of the things, so it's like, there are, and you know, we see the technology on the table. So you could as assume that STEM was just using this like, you know, visual mapping from like whatever the cloud of all the surveillance mechanisms to like pay attention, like to figure out, you know, where everything is in the house. And I like, what would have to happen for that not to be the case in the car is if um, Gray had some like anti, uh, anti surveillance, like uh, sort of coding on the outside of his car <laughs> in order for none of that information to be able to sort of be um, sort of dispersed out. So, I mean, it is kind of interesting to think car. about what? Does control a neighboring car at some point, or he, I don't know, STEM. I don't know if we can assign a gender to STEM. Right. So then, but so that's the, yeah. But then it's like, but you imagine it's like, yeah. So then, but there's the control. So it's not that STEM can't control anything outside the car. It's just that STEM can't control anything inside the car because there's no out external information about everything, which, I mean, I think the interest, the geeky thing to say about that, if that's like the story and that's like, I'm sure there's other stories to tell is how much work do people need to do? So it's like, I mean, you think about gray as like the natural, the natural state in this like constantly, like constantly sort of progressed like technological place, but actually for gray to actually live the kind of life that, you know, has that kind of car where technologies can't enter or for gray to be the only specimen that STEM could find that didn't have any sort of a computer in, implant inside, like that's actually, it seems like there's a lot of decision-making that and a lot of effort on the part of Gray to actually live that kind of life, right? And so, I mean, this is going back to, I think, Suru's point where, you know, the technology does change us and changes society and changes what the norms and expectations are in such a way that like, you actually have to work really hard to reject some of these technological um, advances in your environment. 
And I think building on that, it would have been much, much easier for STEM to integrate with a person who had other sorts of technology implanted. Um, because the reality is, it's very difficult for technology to control biological systems. It's much easier for technology to control technology. So I think um, that's really one of the barriers that we have in, in implementing something like this in real life. And I think if there is a plot hole in the movie, that, that would be a big one. Um, why in the world Stum wanted someone who didn't have any of the shortcuts that could potentially make Gray faster, more of a ninja, because really the reality is he's three months out after a spinal cord injury, right? All of his muscles are atrophied. He's not even going to be able to grip with his normal grip strength. There's no way he's getting out of his chair and um, doing some of the fight scenes he's doing. I mean, if that were the case, I've got a whole slew of therapists who would be signing up for this sort of thing to help their patients. So um, I think that's that's another question that that goes back to like, how do we make people super bionic or augmented? As long as you're still using the human nervous system, there are certain limitations that we have, except by making the nervous system more efficient. If you want to do something that is superhuman beyond the nervous system, then, then that's even a different kind of technology you need to figure out. Yes, that's very... Yes, that's also made me thinking about this. We have this internet of things right now and technologies. And in the future, it's possible that the vehicle, they are communicating with other vehicles and vehicles that communicate with each other directly. And what if that's some vehicles that are attackers and they try to send out those bad signals to disrupt other, uh, other vehicles. And this, this is something that uh, I think is interesting uh, from uh, uh, from this movie, I think we can build this connection with this real world applications. It even may in the future really implement such that technologies in the real world. What's the type of issues that we need to be careful and uh, to, to make sure that technology does not ruin the society? Yeah, I'm with you. I think if you're going to be paranoid about anything in this movie, it's not so much that you're going to have a stem hijacking your body, it's that you have an autonomous vehicle that is connected to a network system and maybe other autonomous vehicles and they kidnap you and take you somewhere or you know another vehicle runs yours off the road. I, I think that is something that is a potential that could happen, especially in the way that current semi-autonomous vehicles are, are developing these days. Fantastic. All right, we probably have time for one last question. And, uh, and then we'll have to wrap up, but we can continue exchanging messages. People, attendees, uh, if they have further messages, they're welcome to email us at ccbs at osu.edu. Um, and make sure you've signed up for our mailing lists. Um, so here's the question. What are STEM's rights, both before and after? Uh, well, I guess, I guess he was autonomous the whole time. Well, he was not before and after he becomes autonomous, what are STEM's rights? Are we treating STEM like a human? I, I think that's the first question. Or is STEM a corporation? Or and are we talking legal rights? Or are we talking ethically? Let's go with ethically. I mean, I'll, I'll start by saying that I think that a lot of, it, it was one question and Marcy was asking like, why does STEM wanna be in a, this body, right? Like this particular body, it seems like a challenge, but also like, why does STEM wanna be embodied in general, right? And I think that, I mean, this came up in one of the um, participant questions, like, you know, how much are we, one concern that I have is like, you know, we just like anthropomorphizing everything. And so we see artificial intelligence. We start thinking that like machine learning, like these are things that humans do. They have intelligence and they like learn, right? And I do think that um, 
there is this sort of jump to to not only like not only anthropomorphize these kinds of technologies, but also to um, you know just sort of like put confer onto them sentience, confer onto them consciousness, and I mean one of the things that is potentially interesting is that it seems at least like the conceit of the movie is that STEM is not sentient, right? So STEM cannot feel pain, it seems. Um, and STEM can maybe not have touch, like feel pleasure, right? So it's like, maybe that's why STEM wants to actually be embodied in a, a physical entity. And so I think that, you know, depending on how we think about moral status, like sentience is a really important threshold that people think about. Consciousness is another threshold that people think about. Um, and then there's also just sort of the cognitive capacities, including the capacity to like be held morally accountable and to hold others morally accountable, right? And so we need to know a lot more about the technology and what is going on, but there's nothing in the movie Throughout the movie, it seems like there's nothing in the movie to articulate that STEM actually has any of these features that we tend to um, sort of confer moral status to. I agree. I, I think um, when some of that list, some of the list, I think we definitely could suggest that other primates my cats, you know, have some of those things, although I'm, I'm not real sure if I can hold them responsible for some of the things they do, but, um, and if that's the case, what are their rights? And I think we would have to make a really strong argument for STEM to have more rights than say a person's pet. And what that threshold would be, I'm not sure. It's, I don't think it's enough to say, well, now STEM is embodied um, in a human form. Um, but by the same argument, there are robots that are embodied, um, in something that looks like a human form. When I was at South by Southwest in 2016, one of the sort of cutting edge humanoid robots that I, I think they're actually, uh, one of the, the uses is to develop as sex workers, um, what are the rights of, of that sort of, of entity? And would they be different than the rights of something like a stem in a human body? I, I think these are important questions, but what that threshold is, I, I think um, we, we need more philosophical discussion over that. And then I think by extension, the other question that I would have is, are there certain kinds of decision making, certain kinds of algorithms that that we would eventually say, yeah, that this is a semi-autonomous or autonomous, or mm -hmm. they deserve to have certain rights. Um, maybe they get to control weapon systems around the world. I don't know, right? Um, so I, I think that these are important questions that we need to answer as we're developing these technologies. Yeah, in some ways, I wish that STEM hadn't orchestrated the whole thing and STEM was simply a chip embodied in one person and that's it because it limits STEM's scope and does offer the theme, the theme to develop of a possibly intelligent agent that is trapped in some way. Um, and then you could you know, you could divide this out into something that is autonomous, something that is not, but maybe does have uh, feelings in the, in the way that humans do. There's mm -hmm. the philosophical term of qualia, where you, there's some quality of our experience that could be pain, it could be pleasure. Uh, do you need to have those things to have rights? Um, moral responsibility is a tricky one because there are definitely very stimulus bound animals like your cat, my dog. <laughs> he learns a lot of tricks, but he cannot stop himself from stealing food from my kids, no matter how hard we try to get him to. Um, but surely he has rights too. So um, 
I know these are all heavily explored in, in, in philosophy, but I don't, know, I don't know if Shuru wanted to add something to this last question here, but. Well, actually I don't have, yeah, yeah, any particular, yeah, to flat. Yeah, well, I guess we're out of time. Uh, this was extremely fun. Uh, I, I personally learned a lot and really enjoyed it. Um, in my narrow world of research, I don't get to talk to folks like you. So this has been really great for me. Uh, I hope our audience <laughs> feels similarly. Um, and I wanna thank all of you. I wanna thank our captioning person, Christina. I want to thank Lauren Marshall, our CCBS administrative person who has really uh, put all of this together. Um, and I wanna thank all the attendees. So hope you enjoy the rest of your very busy weeks and stay tuned for our next, next CCPS events. Thanks everybody. Thank you. Hi, thank you.